Hey class, I hope you guys are all doing well today. We are going to now move into uh, our first PowerPoint lecture on uh, revolutions and today's topic is going to be uh, the Enlightenment. Uh, the Enlightenment was a time period of expanse in, in thinking and uh, basically uh, the masses were, were being influenced by Enlightenment thinkers and it was basically a uh, platform to launch off of in regards to um, revolution, revolting against the traditional um, government, the traditional institutions, uh, and rejecting that through thinking and through reasoning. And so instead of just following things based on tradition or following things because they were taught that way, let's say in the church, um, or even just following things based on your faith, uh, they would uh, attack those, the Enlightenment thinkers would attack those to get people to start thinking for themselves. So it's, no, not, it's not all about the king, what the king wants. We, you, he wouldn't even be king without the people. And so it was this kind of switch and a shift in thought to um, it's the people that are the ones that have the power. It's the people that are the ones that uh, dictate what society wants or what society should have, uh, not the monarchy or not the Catholic Church, or not the Church, or whatever whatever it is. And so there's definitely a, a liberal bend to the Enlightenment. There's definitely an anti-religious, uh, anti-church um, kind of a feel for the um, Enlightenment thinkers. Uh, even though the Enlightenment thinkers, they, they did allow um, and did, did support religious toleration, what that means is if, if you want to worship, Fine, go worship. Uh, but if you don't want to worship, there should not be some kind of penalty against you if you don't want to worship in a church, if you want to leave the church, or whatever it is. And so it would basically be like, yeah, religious you can be, religion can be tolerated, but if someone doesn't want it, then fine, you need to leave that person alone because they are off basically thinking more like the Enlightenment. So uh, the Enlightenment has there's there's a lot of philosophers with the Enlightenment. We're not going to get into a bunch of them, uh, but uh, that's uh, um, just a quick, quick in a nutshell look at um, at what the Enlightenment's about. The end of the PowerPoint is going to be more uh, in regards to Enlightenment ideology and how they look at government and how they look at society. Enlightenment thinkers. So um, just hang on there. We'll just uh, hang in there. We're just going to move into the PowerPoint. Uh, take some good notes because we've got to kind of get it in our mind. Um, of how this thought process occurs that would cause people to then um, launch out into revolution. Revolutions Part 1 This PowerPoint's not going to be as uh, long, but uh, we do need to touch on why uh, the age of revolution uh, takes place. You can see the dates there of the age of revolution. 1774 to 1849 is the age of revolution. And basically it's the tumultuous years of revolutions within Europe uh, that stem from Enlightenment ideology. And that's what we're going to be talking about today is basically the Enlightenment as you look at the revolutions, there are many revolutions that take place during this time period where the people are rebelling against their authority and they revolt. They have a revolution. And so you can think of the first one there on the screen, American Revolution. So that's the Revolutionary War when the colonies rebel and revolt against King George III and Parliament in England and they um, fight the Revolutionary War, Commander-in-Chief being George Washington, and uh, the colonies win the Revolutionary War. And because they had declared their independence from um, Great Britain, and then they end up writing the Constitution. The country's established. The United States of America is established. You have the French Revolution, which we're going to talk about that. The French Revolution with the guillotine and and uh, all the all the things that take place in France. 
Haitian, Irish, Serbian, Latin American, Greek. These are all revolutions that take place. And then one other thing that's interesting is that during this time period, it's alongside the Industrial Revolution. So the, obviously the Industrial Revolution is not a violent revolution, uh, but definitely the Industrial Revolution provided tools of war uh, for the violence. And so uh, the Industrial Revolution is also going on um, during this time also. Okay, so the Enlightenment, what does it mean? It, it's the Age of Reason. Enlightenment, Age of Reason. And this is the 16th, uh, sorry, the 17th, to 18th centuries. So the 1600s, 1700s. Um, and basically what it was was a transformation of human thought to use reason to transform the world. And it was, the Enlightenment is a, is a, a thinking ideology. It's it's reasoning, uh, use of, of thought, uh, looking at everything through pure rational analysis. And what happens is in the, in the Enlightenment, it's basically uh, reason and thinking and and uh, this idea of using elevated human thought, marrying that with individualism. Those two things together, reason and individualism, individualism, is over tradition. And so for centuries and centuries, the, the culture, the societies, they've been just basically operating on tradition, the tradition of the church, the tradition of the, of the monarchy, the tradition of your lot in life is where you are. If you're low class, you will be low class forever. If you're middle class, you will remain middle class, but maybe go lower class, but you'll remain middle class. If you're upper class, then you know you're the elite and you won't have anything to do with low class. So it's just this idea of tradition. Uh, so reason and individualism over tradition. Uh, next, it's understanding the natural w world through thinking and reasoning. If you're looking at the natural world, trying to figure things out of the natural world through reasoning, well, some things you look at and it's basically um, God did that. You have faith that God did that. God is the intelligent designer of things. God is the creator of the universe. Uh, these kind of ideas, and through reasoning and and enlightenment thinking, a uh, man whose heart is desperately wicked, whose um, thoughts are sinful, uh, they can begin to write out God, get rid of God, and that's exactly what takes place. There's an influx of philosophers. You may have have um, heard of them: uh, Descartes, Locke, uh, Newton, Kant, Goethe, Voltaire, Rousseau, Adam Smith, and some of some of them, not all, but some of them were like almost like vehement atheists. I mean, Voltaire was just known for being anti-God. Uh, the Enlightenment challenged traditional religious views, as I've mentioned, tra challenged religious views, and really what it is the age of enlightenment were basically the liberal thinkers of their day um, if you um, think of liberalism and and the value is is within man and the thought of man becomes predominant the thought of man is what um, counts then Ideas that come down through tradition, ideas that come down through uh, teaching, uh, and in, in, in this case here, in, in regards to traditional religious views, uh, teaching that came down through the generations based on theology and doctrine, uh, it was all challenged by the, and they wanted to get rid of it, and, and, and many many times they did. The Age of Enlightenment. Okay, so the goal of the Enlightenment was to influence the masses to agree with and follow Enlightenment ideas. So when you think of a movement, it's not much of a movement if no one follows you. But what happens is they, they're set out with this goal to influence the masses and get them to agree. Their key attack was that religion stifles freedom of thought. So they would basically say, if you if you're part of this religious group, if you are part of this church, uh, 
if you are even a believer in the Bible, all of that will stifle your freedom to think freely, to think how you want. Those things influence you too much to think how you want. And so they use that to attack people. Um, they, they would use that as an attack. And, and the people would then think, oh, wait, I do want to think freely and would start to get rid of the religious side so that they could just start thinking uh, basically for and of themselves. It valued reason, science, religious tolerance, natural rights such as life, liberty, and property. Um, Religious tolerance is in there because it's not that they wanted to just get rid of religion because if you got rid of religion, then um, because that's part of society, it's part of people, um, if you got rid of it, how could that be basically uh, true uh, rational thought? So what they did was they um, they valued religious tolerance. You, no one should be able to tell you what um, what you are to believe, and if someone does, then you can leave. You can go and you can go do something else. You can go be another religion. You can go be uh, reject all religion. Whatever it is that you want to do, you can go do. And no one should come down on you for that. So the religious um, institutions, the church, religious groups should not persecute you if you decide to leave religion. The Enlightenment developed theories of governance, how to govern. The center of the Enlightenment was France. The work um, was the focus towards regular people rather than the scholars. Uh, so the, the, the Enlightenment thinkers, they would write. They did a lot of writing. They produced a lot of books. And, and uh, it was basically focused for the masses to be able to read and understand. It wasn't writings just for scholars. It was to really influence the masses. And so what they did, look, notice the works there at the bottom of the screen, they... Uh, wrote histories, they wrote novels, they had dramas, satires, they wrote pamphlets, cheap little pamphlets for people to read. Uh, Some major figures in the Enlightenment, John Locke, 1632 to 1704. He applied natural law to politics. Uh, He attacked the divine right and absolute monarchies. And so this is Enlightenment thinking. Again, um, Attacking God, attacking the belief that God chose the rulers for lands like England. Um, he attacked absolute monarchy. So if he's doing this, the the masses are going to listen to this and and rebel. Uh, gave strong support and justification for the glorious revolution of 1688 and the constitutional monarchy. So he was definitely um, hand in hand uh, with with a, a, like a grassroots movement, the power of the people type idea. Number two major figure, uh, Adam Smith, seventeen twenty three to seventeen ninety. Uh, he was more of a, a thinker in regards to the economy. Uh, law of supply and demand determines the market. So before that. Um, the trade was controlled basically by the monarchy, and um, whenever you have a um, dictator or a monarch or uh, absolute power, that is going to affect. Uh, that it's basically going to affect a free market or uh, a capitalistic idea, uh, because they're going to start dictating how things should go if they they want to. Um, control all the gold then they'll control the gold rather than being a free market of gold or of grain or of sugar cane or whatever whatever it is um, this law of supply and demand is a supply and demand based on the people and it de- determines the market and the price of how much something is going to cost Okay, number three, Baron de Montesquieu, 1689 to uh, 1755. Uh, ignore those pictures on the right. I forgot to update the pictures. So that's not the same. Those aren't the guys. Uh, developed uh, political theory, um, how political parties can foster prosperous and stable societies. 
And so, I mean, you start thinking about this, it's going against monarchy. I mean, you're having political parties and you're having um, prosperous societies based on those parties when usually it's the the king is the one that's going to dictate um, the prosperity of the country through his good ruling or his bad ruling. Well, this obviously is in the face of the king. Uh, Number four, Francois Voltaire, uh, 1694 to 1778. This was um, the guy, the philosopher, who really focused on individual freedom, uh, attack on any kind of institution. He attacked monarchy. He attacked the church. He tried to stamp out Bibles. Uh, So, again, I'm sorry about that. These pictures, just ignore these pictures that I'm scribbling over with the cursor. Uh, just ignore that. Uh, those are not... That, that's not Voltaire down there. <laughs> okay, so Enlightenment theme number one is government. Okay, what did this do? What did the Enlightenment do that affected government? Again, this is all pushing towards the setup for revolutions. Okay, so in regards to government, you have the doctrine of political theory. Government is created by and subject to the will of the people. This is what the political theory in regards to the government is during the Enlightenment. Popularity, sovereignty, and authority lies with the people, not the monarchy or the ruler. Okay, so it's kind of self-explanatory, but the, it's basically a government for the pe- by the people and for the people, and it's not by the monarchy or for the monarchy. Only way to protect the rights of citizens is a government by and for the citizens. And obviously, if you start thinking about revolutions, the m- monarchies were doing things that were oppressive to the people, were unfair to the people, their rights were being violated. And so to the Enlightenment said, in regards to government, that the only way to fully protect the rights of citizens is for the, to have a government by and for the people. Okay, John Locke, he wrote the Second Treatise on Civil Government in 1690. It was his most influential work on government. The premise was that governments are established when people decide to work together, form a civil society, and protect and promote the people's interest. So basically it's a handbook on how to create a stable society with a government by the people and for the people. If people withdraw consent, then they can replace the government or ruler. And so now you're thinking of whatever whatever government they have in place that the people decide to have in place, if they say, if the people say, no, we want something different, then they can replace that kind of government. They can abolish the government and create something new. It replaced the divine, his, his work, Second Treaties of, on Civil Government, replaced divine right of the ruler with the rule of the people. So again, it just gets rid of that divine right of rulers. And it relocated sovereignty from the monarch uh, to the society. So it's no longer um, like an attack on the country as an attack on the king type idea. Uh, Sovereignty of the nation is based on um, the society itself. The society has sovereignty. So we would not, in the United States, we, we're a sovereign nation. We would not say that we're sovereign because of the president. We say we're sovereign because we have a constitutional uh, a constitution um, by the people. And so the people are the ones that say that we have sovereignty. Okay, the second theme. So that was government. Now we're going to move on to society. The Enlightenment theme on society, and this is called natural rights. All people have rights to life, liberty, and property. This is an Enlightenment idea. Basically saying that you should be able to um, obviously have the right to life. You shouldn't just be killed for making somebody unhappy. Um, 
you have the right to liberty or freedom. And then also in the Enlightenment period, the right to property. They said that was a right uh, that if you had, if you could purchase the property or you inherited the property, then, then that is your, your property of the right to that. Um, under natural rights, people will exchange some freedom for protection of life, liberty, and property. And what that means is any government is going to have some kind of a hierarchy or some kind of a structure to it. And let's just say, for example, um, the, the laws of the land, well, you're going to submit to the laws of the land, and the government, uh, by the people, okay, we got to remember, it's by the people, they're going to uh, create law. And so that means you will have to submit to the law of, let's say, paying taxes. Let's say they pass a law that you have to pay a tax. Well, you'll submit to that law, and in return, the government is going to protect your life, liberty, and property. That's the way it's kind of supposed to work. So you'll submit to paying taxes or submit to some laws that the government has put into place and has um, enforced and you give up some of that freedom. You, so you're not just like, I'm never going to pay taxes. No, you give up that never paying taxes kind of idea, and you'll submit and pay some taxes. Next is the rights should be equal regardless of class or social privilege. That's natural rights. And, of course, throughout history, um, societies have really struggled with that, this. I mean, you just think of... Um, the days of slavery, you think of civil rights. So regardless of class or social privilege, rights should be equal. And then all are equal before the law. Okay, so that's the Enlightenment theme on society for natural rights. Jean-Jacques Rousseau, he was a French-Swiss thinker, political um, equality. He believed that uh, in politics uh, there should be equality. So it should not be that if somebody is uh, a king that uh, they are above politically. You know, so for example, um, in our country we have a president. Well, he belongs to a political party, and before he's elected as president, he's equal in regards to politics as anybody else. Well, right now. Uh, we have President Donald Trump. He's a Republican, so we have a Republican in that office. So we don't have a Democrat in that office. It's a Republican. So, but before that, there was equality with the the voting. So you have a um, a Democrat and a Republican going to um, for the same position, and so but there's equality between them, and it's just who's going to be voted in. He had a disdain for elite class privilege. A society was collectively sovereign. We talked about that already. All individuals participate in creating law. Now, again, this is a French thinker. The way we do it in the United States is that we have representatives, and they they write bills, and they pass bills, and it goes from the House committees to the House of Representatives. If it passes committee and passes the House of Representatives, then it goes to the Senate committees. If it passes the Senate committee, then it goes to the Senate. If it passes the Senate, then it goes to the president, and then he can sign it into law. But he does not create law. It's the Congress that creates law, and the president signs it. So that's how we do it, where individual participates in creating law. Uh, he wrote Social Contract in uh, 1762. He wrote that piece. Okay, so natural rights. Although most... Enlightenment thinkers were of common birth, but comfortable means. Okay, that's kind of important. They were basically kind of like middle class. Most of the thinkers were like middle class people. And they wanted to limit the ruling and the aristocratic upper class. They definitely wanted to limit them. The Enlightenment thinkers did not really envision a rights for all, even if their works stated it. So they would say, yes, equality. They would say, yes, uh, you know, freedoms and liberty and equality. They would say all of these things. But in their works, that's really not what they meant because they did not encourage rights, especially political rights, to women, 
to peasants, to laborers, to slaves, to freed slaves, the freemen, uh, to children. So when you start thinking of rights of people, you know they didn't give they they weren't giving rights out to some of these people like women. They couldn't even vote for the longest. Um, you know the rights of children. Uh, you know ch- uh, children in regards to child labor. You know there were children in the 19th century that were you know working 18 hours a day in coal mines and and uh, other uh, industrial areas. Uh, they didn't have any rights, but yet the Enlightenment thinkers. Um, you know, they really fought for these things and wrote about these things, but they didn't really give it all to everybody equally. So this is the Enlightenment, and this is going to be the kind of like the platform that we spring off of in regards to the revolutions, because now instead of just people bowing down and, I'll just say, obeying the monarch because of their absolute authority in the monarchy, now you have people rebelling and revolting against the monarchy because they are beginning to think for themselves. They're going to be uh, following and being influenced by these writers who are saying it should be the power of the people. Um, The political machine should be for the benefit of the people. So these ideas start to roll and and meld and mesh in their heads until um, groups begin to revolt. And... uh, the next uh, PowerPoint we're going to look at is going to be the beginning of uh, the American Revolution. Okay, class, that's going to be it for the PowerPoint in regards to the Enlightenment. I apologize for that, uh, those pictures not being updated. What I do is I, um, I duplicate the slide uh, for the next slide, and because it was two philosophers here, and then I duplicated it for the next one, obviously I updated the information on the people, but I forgot to get new pictures uh, for uh, Voltaire and, and uh, uh, the other philosopher, I can't remember. Uh, but uh, I apologize for that. I guess if you want to look at a picture of them, you can Google it and, and look at a picture of Voltaire. Uh, but that is going to be it for uh, this uh, PowerPoint lecture. Uh, we're going to then move next time into our first revolution, which is going to be the U.S. Um, or the colonial or American, whatever you want to call it, uh, uh, revolution. And it's the beginning of uh, the United States. So I'm looking forward to that. Uh, Keep up on the reading. Keep on the studies. Uh, Don't forget uh, uh, your paper topics. Now's a good time to start really getting down uh, to researching and getting the um, resources for your papers. I know we have uh, the spring break coming up, and you can work on it. But I just want to uh, remind you uh, of that. Uh, Other than that, I'll see you next time. Take care.